Okay. This is on? Yeah, great. Thank you. It's great to see you all today. Terrible weather. We know it. What better place to be than at a D seminar? I'm delighted to welcome everybody today to the seminar we're having with Laura Schoberg, who's our main speaker, uh, and she will be speaking on the topic sex rule and state borders in global politics. Uh, the seminar is a collaboration with our colleagues from Mobile. They are, two of them are here, but in particular it was Will Jones who reached out to me, uh, which is a research center at the Faculty of Law at the University of Copenhagen, and also with Matthias, uh, a colleague from the Department of Political Science. Uh, the topic uh, that Laura will be speaking to today addresses and takes on a uh, well-known pattern uh, that uh, while researchers and activists who work in the area of gender politics, feminist politics, have had some success in bringing issues of gender and sexuality into the areas of what people call soft politics, normative power, uh, much less success in the areas of hard politics, the state and security. I was just myself in an evaluation uh, group about uh, evaluating uh, Danish research uh, gender aid, uh, and it was clear, and you know, people were citing Finnish uh, um, uh, ministry people that in the normative issues, support for sexual and reproductive health rights, support for um, training about uh, gender-based violence, the embassies and ministries are full on. But if you talk about issues of gender and sexuality for hardcore issues like the state and security, there is very little resonance there. And that's exactly the topic uh, she will be leading us through today. Um, she comes uh, with a background in feminist and queer uh, work in international relations. And uh, she will be taking us through themes about uh, how we understand the state, uh, the reproduction of the state, how borders are controlled, how uh, borders regulate who crosses them, and what is acceptable. She will be uh, taking, I think, on a big journey through both historical and contemporary examples. But just a reminder that uh, in a Danish context, uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, asylum uh, as an organization has noted that uh, many of the uh, asylum seekers, LGBT uh, plus asylum seekers who are denied uh, asylum are done so on the basis that uh, the authorities think they're lying. And they're often thought to be lying because the stories they tell about their past uh, or the way they behave in the present don't match the assumptions and stereotypes of what a proper lesbian or gay man should be. So these are also quite actual issues in Denmark today. Laura will be our main speaker. She has for max 45 minutes, though she doesn't need to use that entire time. She comes to us as British Academy Global Professor of Politics and International Relations at Royal Holloway University of London, and uh, where she's also a director of the Gender Institute. And following her talk, uh, our colleague Atri Sen and Matthias Hummer will make comments. Uh, Tre is uh, 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 at the, uh, she is associate professor of the Department of Anthropology here in Copenhagen, and a political anthropologist with expertise in urban South Asia. And Matthias is a research assistant in the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen, has just delivered his PhD to be defended in a couple of months, and he works at the intersections of international relations, gender and visual politics. So they have together 20 minutes and they'll coordinate that. But in any case, this will leave us with a good 30 minutes for Q&A. So with that, Laura. Okay, I think I've unmuted myself. There's a likelihood that I will talk too loud for the microphone. Um, so please just tell me about that and I'll try to talk softer, um, something like that. But hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, I actually gave a talk here, I think just over 10 years ago um, on my 
gendering global conflict book on theorizing war. And I got great feedback on that, so I'm very excited to be presenting this in a much earlier stage. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this project, the basic argument of it is fairly straightforward but often neglected, which is that sexual relations are international relations and international relations are inherently sexual. And so the project is called Sexual Relations as International Relations because I'm not very good at titles of things. Um, Usually the book title happens after the book happens for me. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not good, but so far we're going with this. Um, so it's interested in the ways in which states are directly constructed by or reliant on acts of sex or significations of acts of sex. Um, which I feel like is somewhat attended to in global politics in certain ways, but not in others. So for example, there's a fair amount of attention given to conflict sexual violence or to sexual abuse in organizations, um, but there are a number of ways in which I think the role of sex acts in constituting the state is neglected. And I'm gonna try and convince you of that in our short period of time. Um, or make fun of myself until you believe me out of pity. Uh, one of the two. Um, okay, so this is uh, a direct quote from Spike Peterson, that making states is making sex. Um, and her argument is basically that states have had a vested interest in the sexual control of their citizens for as long as there have been states. And in fact, the early production of the state was based on an invested interest in the reproductive labor that goes into making the state. So what goes into making an us is the reproduction of that us and then that reproduction becomes governed by questions of propriety and governed by questions of in-group and things like that throughout kind of the policy of like the ways that states make policies, right? So the argument is that states are interested in who has babies, what babies they have, with whom they have the babies, um, and then how those babies are raised and produced into adults and that this is actually quite essential for every function of the state, from trade to militarism uh, to border control and things like that. So the fundamental argument is that states can't be made without sex, and that states are then invested in the control of sex as they are constructing and reconstructing and performing their existence and their borders. So. The argument that I'm trying to make here, um, and now I'm feeling self-conscious because Will says that my PowerPoint is monochrome and it is monochrome, um, and it's on purpose that it's monochrome, um, and I'm not really sure why, uh, but sorry for <laughs> embarrassing Will over there. Um, but but I, I, and the background art, um, in so much as it is art, uh, is actually mine. Um, so I blurred a bunch of pictures because I thought it was cute. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about them as it is. Um, but okay, so the basic argument that I want to walk you through is that sex plays a role in building the state, um, so in making the state a thing to begin with, and then in consolidating the state, so in the state going from its early forms to its current we call it Westphalian, but that's an argument for a different day, uh, kind of understanding of contemporary sovereignty in controlling entrance to the state. So this is the part of the project that's about migration law, both marriage partner migration law and refugee law. Um, and then in consolidating the identity of the state. So when the state ends up uh, using issues of sex and sexuality to claim its identity internationally and particularly to claim its superiority internationally. Um, okay, so the first part then is the building the state. Um, and this is actually a marriage treaty in the background. Um, I could only find one of them actually written up and it's not one that's a case study in the book. Um, but it's, it's actually a marriage treaty. Okay, so when I say building the state through treaty marriage, 
I think that the thing that I'm interested in is that treaty marriages in a number of places, and for now we'll focus on Western Europe, um, often came with the rest of a treaty. So it was either an alliance or an end to a war, the change of territory. And what happened was that whatever the other parts of the treaty were came into effect at the consummation of the marriage. So not at the ceremony of the marriage, not at like the six times that the marriage was performed by proxy before it was actually performed, which was totally a thing, uh, but actually at the consummation of the marriage. Um, and so, for example, one of the treaty marriages in the book is the treaty marriage that ended the war between Spain and France, um, which kind of continued from the Thirty Years' War. Um, and it was between Louis XIV um, and Maria Theresa of Spain. Um, so literally, uh, and I'm going to be a little facetious here, you were a resident of Spain and then two people you didn't know had sex and then you were a resident of France. Um, and so uh, that's something that I think really interested me about kind of the constitution of uh, treaty marriages and the state. Um, and I'm going to try to be a little deeper than that, although I do think that's an interesting fact. Um, so treaty marriages uh, occur around borders in a ritualized way. So very often what would happen is that the uh, bride's family would bring the bride and all sorts of pomp and circumstance to the border after the proxy uh, performance of a marriage. Um, and then the marriage would happen on one side of the border and then it would happen again on the other side of the border. Um, and then it would happen a third time um, all the way at the place that was the castle or whatever of the king prince who was the, on the other side of the treaty marriage. So in some sense, uh, there were like eight marriage ceremonies in some of these. Uh, but a lot of the ritualization happened around the border. And particularly, one of the ritualizations that happened around the border was the changing of the appearance of the bride from the nationality from which she came to the nationality in which she was going uh, before she met the groom. Um, so there was kind of like an actual ritualization around the crossing of the border. Okay, um, so they also, uh, they're used to end wars and conflicts. They're also used to declare alliances. Um, so you cement an alliance by sending a treaty marriage, um, which by the way, didn't only include the one person who was the subject of the treaty. It would often be between 20 and 30 uh, subordinate marriages so that the person who is the subject of the treaty had support and also to further integrate alliances. Um, so they were used to end wars, although more often they caused as many wars as they ended. Um, so when I mentioned the marriage between Louis XIV and Maria Theresa, a uh, irresponsibly enforced part of that treaty led to the War of Spanish Secession a hundred years later. Um, so there's kind of a lot of, uh, well, does this really work to do the things that uh, in theory kinship should do, um, which it doesn't totally. Um, but it's also used to exchange territories and set borders. Um, so the way that a border would often be set is around the negotiation about an exchange of money, an exchange of marriage, and an exchange of territory. Um, so in some sense, the thing that I'm interested in here is that when the treaty marriage, like the thing about the treaty marriage that matters for the rest of these things is the consummation. Um, and that's partly a religious investment in marriage starting at consummation. Um, but it is actually also an investment in that being the symbol of when things change. So the consummation of the marriage is also the consummation of the new relationship. Um, and that ends up being pretty salient in a wide variety of treaty marriage situations. So... That's kind of the first part of the argument. The second part of the argument is that it helps to consolidate and reproduce the state, that sex acts matter in the consolidation and reproduction uh, of the state. Um, where the geopolitics of birth is a big deal, right? And this actually happens very differently in different places in the world, but it always matters. So for example, in Western Europe, 
European dynastic marriages, legitimacy mattered a lot. Um, in a number of dynastic situations outside of Western Europe, legitimacy didn't matter at all. Um, but actually different parts of the production of heirs mattered more. Um, but almost always there's a geopolitics of are there children, which children will be picked, which children are trained, which children are the ones that are understood as somehow superior. So the superiority would sometimes be pedigree, not legitimacy, um, or it would sometimes be age, not legitimacy, or something like that. But almost always there was a politics of which children were born, when, and how in order to figure out how to do state consolidation and empire consolidation. Um, there's also a sense that the female consort serves as mother and often nothing else. Um, so where the motherhood function of the female consort uh, is what defines her life, her membership, her power. Um, so the easiest one and the most familiar one here in Western European contexts were the female consorts who couldn't bear legitimate male heirs and how they were treated once that was kind of concluded, whether legitimately or not. Um, but there's also different ways in which, for example, in the Mughal Empire, um, female consorts had a different place in the harem uh, based on their reproductive capacities um, and then also based on the success of their children in different training programs and things like that. Um, so very often, kind of the female consort is reduced to a womb or a potential womb and that ends up being kind of a lot of the state consolidation, um, where then like if the female consort has failed in some way or another, um, then there's the entitlement to get a new female consort because the state must go on um, in some way or another. And I'm being pretty generic here, um, but the story can be told in a wide variety of different places in a wide variety of different ways. Um, so there's also in some sense a link to contemporary reproduction here, right? And it's not an easy, straightforward, or one-to-one -one link, and I'm not arguing that it is. But I do think that states become concerned now with reproduction as a way to control and understand the future of the state. And this happens in different ways in different states. For example, there are a number of European states that put pressure on their citizens to reproduce, lest the labor markets not outlast the current generation. Whereas you can see some places like China, there was pressure against reproduction for the purposes of sustainability. Um, and then there's also some sense where places who have a lot of military conflict or like make more soldiers, come on, make more soldiers. Um, so it comes in a wide variety of different ways, but the state has a strong hand in reproductive politics kind of across the world in different ways. So then the third part of the argument is the controlling entrance to the state. So I'm going to take you from like 15th and 16th century treaty marriages uh, to contemporary migration policy. And we can see if uh, you believe this should be one book or two, um, because uh, my, my publisher is not convinced, but I'm going to try and keep convincing people um, that it should be one book, maybe. Um, OK, so what I was kind of the, the one sentence thing that got me interested in this part of the Sex and IR project is this, that in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, I can find a number of cases where state borders were set by a sex act. And in the 21st century, I can find a number of cases where your entitlement to be in a state or not depends on your performance of a sex act. So my interest is that sex acts set the borders then, and now they set who goes in them. And that is kind of like the core link that I'd like to make. OK, so there is some sense kind of from a feminist theory view. Um, and I'll try to I'll try to give you a little bit of this um, kind of as a view and not a whole lot that citizenship itself is heteropatriarchal. Right. That in some sense. Um, so as an American, I can make fun of my own state. The ideal American is a heterosexual white male with a wife, 2.3 kids and a dog. Uh, 
I've always been interested in what the point three kid looks like. Um, but that's kind of like, you know, then, then there's a soccer mom image and an understanding that that's like how a citizen is and how a citizen behaves. And of course, everybody else is welcome in theory, although, you know, some days, not others. Uh, but that there is still kind of a heteronormativity of what citizenship is particularly in terms of citizenship as relates to security, where there remains a sense that security is a fundamentally chivalrous thing to do, right? Like where uh, the chivalrous soldier protects their innocent nation from the threats outside um, in some kind of a oversimplified story, obviously, but some sense that soldiering is an act of chivalry. And that remains the case even when soldiering is done by people biologically identified as women, right? Um, there remains a feminized other that is protected even when that feminized other may be men, right? And so there's some sense where the story of citizenship remains somewhat heteropatriarchal, which is weird given that sometimes states now brag about how good they are at not being heteropatriarchal. Uh, but we're gonna talk about what I think is at the basis of that uh, contradiction in just a second. Um, so that heteropatriarchal citizenship remains based on this state control of sexuality and reproduction, right? Um, very often states decide uh, what sex acts are okay and what sex acts are not okay. Um, they also decide how to police what happens when sex acts are not okay. Um, and some of those things I think we would think of as somewhat morally unambiguous. Some of them I think we would think of as quite morally I ambiguous. Um, some of them we would think of, at least I would think of, as just absolutely stupid rules. Um, so for example, it remains illegal to cheat on your spouse in the United States military. Um, it is actually a criminal offense. Um, if you are a member of the United States military to cheat on your spouse, it uh, seems like my tax money could go to better things at the very least. Uh, not to mention it sounds like absolutely none of my business. Um, but, okay, so um, there in marriage migration, and Robin talked about this briefly, there's this question of the genuineness of a relationship. So genuineness in theory means are you really in a relationship or is this what in the US we would call a green card marriage, um, right? Are you doing this just to be able to get into the state? Okay, so in theory, there's like six or seven criteria of this in different places in the world. Um, they vary, but they have some commonality. Um, they're about living together, speaking the same language, um, shared finances, how much you communicate and how, um, and things like that. But um, they are also fairly frequently about sexual relationships. Um, so two key questions come up in the sexual relationships. Number one is, do you have one and does it appear normal? And number two is, is it exclusive? Um, and so those two things come up a lot in proving and asking questions about genuineness. Particularly, so several states have started turning down the marriage partner migration applications of asexual couples, um, even when they meet all of the other criteria. So it's understood that if you don't have a sexual relationship, you are not a marriage partner migration candidate because relationships involve sex. Um, and so some asexual couples make it through, but a number of states have turned them down either kind of one by one or actually on principle. Um, which suggests that you need to have a sexual relationship um, and then you need to prove it, um, which means you need to demonstrate to the state that you have sex. Now, sometimes this doesn't happen, right? Sometimes states just let it go, but they often do ask. Um, and one of the things that I learned in the U.S. context is that actually third party taken photographs of sex acts are evidence against the legitimacy of your sexual relationship. Because real people like privacy, apparently. 
So it turns out that if you need to prove you have sex, then you might want to take pictures, but apparently you might want to take selfies, because if you let someone else take the pictures, then you're not really having sex. Um, which kind of spun my head around for a little loop, uh, something like that. Um, but you have to prove that you have a sexual relationship. Um, and you then also, it is evidence against your migration claim if your sexual relationship is not exclusive even if it is not exclusive on principle, right? So like I have an open relationship is not a thing that most states, and then I'm generalizing across a lot of laws for the purposes of our conversation here, but most states will say that a relationship must be monogamous between two people in order to meet the criteria for marriage partner migration. So you have to prove you're having sex, and you have to prove that this is the only person you're having sex with, um, and that both partners are being uh, f faithful. Yeah, that's probably the word. I'm very good at this, as you can tell. Um, that both partners are being faithful to that. So the material evidence of a sex act actually matters. And I've gotten to read the part of the interview book for both the US and the UK about this. Um, and it turns out they asked some questions that I'm pretty sure I don't know the answer to about myself. Um, so there's a lot of kind of specificity and there's no regard for how culturally this stuff may be difficult to talk about or anything like that. It's just like, tell me, if you screw, how you screw, when you screw, um, and it doesn't matter that I'm a complete stranger and there's probably a translator that knows you um, in the room, right? Um, okay, so there's also kind of the true identity and asylum laws kind of relation to this, and this is what Robin mentioned, that often when you apply for asylum on the basis of being LGBTQ, a state asks, are you really? And when they ask, are you really, um, it was actually only about 10 years ago that we have the last evidence of that involving a medical examination to prove whether or not you have had sex with people of the same sex. So in theory, you apply for LGBTQ asylum because it is dangerous to be LGBTQ in the place that you are from. But uh, often you must prove that you did the dangerous thing, which in theory risked your life because you have to prove that it risked your life, in order to prove that you are indeed LGBTQ. So to say, you know what, it risked my life at home so I didn't do it, but I'd like to do it when I get here, is not okay. Um, and it is also, there's been a lot of discrimination. I have a PhD student working on this against people who are bisexual because that shows a lack of true queer identity. So sometimes the verdict there is, well, if you like both sexes, go home, marry one of the opposite sex, you should be fine. Um, it's called discretion in a lot of these laws. Um, <laughs> where And so like several cases have been turned down, for example, of gay men who had at some point in their life looked at pornographic pictures of women um, because that means that they're interested in women so they can go home and marry a woman and it should be fine. Um, so there's a lot of kind of understanding of legitimacy as not only do you have the sex act that identifies you as not straight, but also are you unwilling to have the sex acts that would identify you as straight and therefore be safe at home? Um, there's also in a lot of ways discrimination against lesbians in this situation because it is assumed for some reason I don't fully understand that one can be a lesbian in a way that is again more discreet than one can be a gay man. Um, so apparently it's perfectly fine to suggest that lesbians marry men and then go have affairs with women. Um, whereas it is not the same to suggest that men marry women and go have affairs with men. Again, these are things I wish I knew nothing about about other people, um, and I don't understand why the state needs to know anything about these things about other people, but apparently it must. Um, and then there's also kind of a weaponization of the performance of sex acts. Um, so there's some view that like, 
uh, the way that we kind of attack a case um, has to do with like, well, you cheated once 15 years ago. Or um, there have been a number of times when marriages that were originally arranged, um, even when they're like 30 years into the marriage, are often uh, denied asylum because they're not, quote, true love, I mean, denied marriage partner migration rights because they're not true love marriages in theory. Um, and one of the things that is weaponized is, well, it took them a year after they got married to have sex. Now, it doesn't matter that, you know, 30 years later they have like eight kill children and 10 grandchildren and, you know, like clearly have a sexual relationship then, but they didn't start being together because they wanted to have sex. So then that becomes a problem. And of course, like, I'm also conflating some other cultural biases in this, but I enjoy my part of the narrative. So I'm going to tell you about that. Um, okay, so then uh, here's the last kind of part of it, which is the wielding of homonormativity as a condition of national membership. Um, so there's a number of places in the international arena now where a racialized intolerant other state is compared to the good tolerant self state. Uh, so I use a, a copying Cindy Weber, Hillary Clinton's right side of history speech for this, right? Like we treat our women and our queers really good in the United States, we're on the right side of history, come join us as if she had read Francis Fukuyama or something creepy like that. Um, but there's a lot of this logic that kind of goes on through the, the ways that states talk about themselves and how they treat their women and their queers uh, compared to other states. Um, and these examples can be found kind of throughout Western liberal democracies and actually even in some leftist autocracies, right, in terms of like how they treat their uh, women and their queers. Um, so in some sense, homonationalism is one of the new measures of the securable state, right? Like we include a particular part of our queer population um, and the rest of them are just weird. So we got the good queers with us um, and that's kind of how it gets talked about. Um, and it becomes kind of this measure of, well, you know, we can defend who and what we are now. Um, so like in some sense, feminism is the new democracy, um, something like that. Um, oops, there was meant to be, okay, now I can't make it go backwards. There's meant to be another bullet point there, so I'm just going to pretend that the other bullet points there tell you about it and then move on. Okay, so the part of the book that is about this is actually that I found in six different states on the test, the written test about becoming a citizen or getting a the right to, in the UK, it's called indefinite leave to remain, um, right? So getting the right to stay. Um, there's a question that shows a public display of affection between two people of the same sex. And the question is, what do you think of this? And if you answer that it is not okay, then it's a problem for your test score because you've demonstrated homophobia. And so the state tries to keep you out if you are homophobic, because our state cannot be homophobic. Now it might actually be that it wouldn't matter if it was a heterosexual couple, you just don't like public displays of affection. Um, and it also might be that you're a homophobe or it might be a bunch of other things, right? Um, but it's a straw test of homophobia on which the state selects for people. And so, like, not a lot of intellectual attention is spent on this because it is largely understood as just a proxy for trying to keep Islamic people out of the state. Um, and it is, right? Like, that's the intent. That's why it's there. Um, but I think it's interesting that it is staked on a sex act, right, in terms of how you would then make those distinctions. Okay, so now the next slide. Sorry about the lack of that uh, bullet point. Oops. Okay, so um, in some sense then, these are kind of my takeaways about thinking about sex in the state. The first is the imagination of the state through the imagination of consummation. Um, so I think about consummating more things than the treaty marriage. Uh, so the consummation of an alliance, the consummation of a new era between states, uh, the consummation of a version of the state and a version of the empire, um, things like that then also the consummation of changing interstate relationships, which I think happens 
fairly frequently when we talk about sexual relationships among and between states and state leaders. And then the consummation of a personal relationship as the consummation of national membership. So this is the marriage partner migration kind of part of it, where when I have sex with somebody of a given nation, it has nationalist uh, significations rather than just sexual. It's not just I have sex, right? It's I have sex with somebody who's a member of that state, which has implications for my membership in that state. Um, and in fact, if I do have sex with that person, I get rights that I might not have if I don't have sex with that person. Um, and I'm using I, even though as an American, I have fairly easy privilege of going anywhere in the world. Um, but that is actually not true of most people in the world, right? Most of them, this actually has a substantive effect on their ability to go places um, and be members of groups. Um, okay, so theoretically, uh, this is kind of where I am, and this is the weakest part of it, but that's why I figured I'd tell you about it so you can help. Um, so uh, Nick Onif has a framework in Worlds of Our Making in 1989 uh, that argues that sets of rules make a state of rule, and that state of rule is one in which a particular set of rules polices how people in states act and behave. And uh, Nick makes fun of me for using this now because I used to make fun of him for having it. Uh, but I do think that actually it says a lot about what I would like to say. And so in my last couple of minutes, I'll try and convince you of this anyway. Um, so my argument here is that this loose constellation of sex rules all have a pretty significant impact on daily life and the life of relations between states, such that these sex rules make a state of sex rule in global politics. Now, I'm not arguing that's the only thing that rules global politics, but I'm suggesting that it plays a significant role in how states interact and in how states treat their citizens. So sex bodies signify and become symbols of the state in a wide variety of contexts, whether that's the British fascination with whether Catherine of Aragon and Arthur actually ever had sex in 1506, um, which they are still fascinated with. Um, and honestly, I'm kind of fascinated myself. Um, or if it's a question of the state kind of putting its nose where it doesn't belong in migration cases and things like that. Um, so in, I think that makes a potential to theorize sexual international security, where sexuality ends up being a condition of security and where it ends up being securitized, where, for example, how we treat our women and our queers all of a sudden becomes a justification for not only self-defense but aggressive action in global politics. And then that's it for me for now. Um, and so I await uh, the commentary and questions and things like that. I'll just stick with the thing. I'm not very good at this. Let's see. Can anyone hear me now? Is this working? Yeah? Okay, great. So thanks a lot for that, Laura. Uh, my name is Atre. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology, and I'm going to kick off the uh, comments and the discussion se uh, session. The way that Matthias and I, we thought we'd do it was uh, j just to carry on with uh, some slides and some images, uh, just to hold on to uh, certain strands of the discussion which, uh, which Laura brought up. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the post-colony and, uh, and pick up the uh, strand of moral policing of, uh, of citizens and, and citizen citizenry uh, from the perspective of uh, countries in the global south. And, uh, and then in my uh, second slide, I'll give you an ethnographic case study, which is uh, from, uh, from the Indian context. Uh, 
So um, in the context of uh, the Global South, a number of countries are becoming increasingly, the states are becoming increasingly concerned about ordinary women's engagement with modernity, which uh, very simply put is that women have watched too many Hollywood movies and uh, read too many uh, books and have decided to uh, have premarital sex, choose their romantic partners and fall in love. So, uh, so what happens in this context of, uh, of the fact that you know, most of these countries, they uphold their cultures, they are like in the context of India, for example, there's a Hindu nationalist government which is in power, uh, very much committed to the purity of the Hindu nation in that context. Um, so what happens when uh, young women, especially uh, women who felt that they've had an education, uh, they've had, uh, they have the potential to earn money and get independent of their families. Uh, what happens when these women decide to choose their own partners, leaving behind traditional ideas of arranged marriages within the same class or within the same caste, um, and also sort of, you know, um, have babies across uh, class and caste, and, and also across religion, which I will talk in a bit. Um, but what is interesting in the context of this debate is the fact that uh, it's always about the, the concern is always about sexual relationships amongst the less affluent people. Because affluent people, for example, if they decide to have premarital sex or they decide to fall in love, they have cafes and bars and restaurants and shopping malls and to go to, or they would have the privacy of having a bedroom in their own houses. So who are the people who are spilling out into public, who are like really visible, whose love is really visible? It's usually women from less affluent backgrounds who would choose public spaces like parks or like, you know, here uh, I have some images uh, from Bombay, which is from the Marine Drive, where um, you know it's, co it's considered to be the site of love infestation, which is that people come and they sit by the, by the water and they romance. Um, now, this particular anxiety, for example, especially in the s states of the Global South, um, it's related to a global uh, cultural anxiety, which is about like you know cross-class marriages, cross-race marriages, and also about feminine intimacies, about making feminine intimacies public. There is a lot of discomfort about the fact that if women's lust or women's love becomes public, then it's kind of like you know, it's attack on on sort of you know the moral project of the state. Um, the local cultural anxiety, which I will talk about in a second is manifested in moral policing, which where the state, which is the lowest rung of the state, usually policemen, for example, they often take up the task of cleansing these areas or cleaning up these areas of this kind of relationships where like, you know, it's very evident that there are couples who are kissing or touching each other or simply being in love in public. So it becomes the responsibility of the state uh, to do this. Now the state comes up with a lot of laws, like whether it's called public pornography or like you know public display of affection as uh, as more as immoral um, and so there's a lot of laws which the state can use uh, various kinds of things like you know stop and search um, stop and search uh, things which is like oh like you know if there are couples then they're probably also carrying drugs in their pockets so you can stop and search them and give them a good beating um, so these are like you know various kinds of laws which are in place which manifests itself in very micro level local level moral policing so what it does is that this kind kind of gendered love, lust, marriage, for example, um, it creates a differentiated citizenship, which is that if you can actually do it behind doors, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see what you're up to, um, then that's completely fine. But if you're doing it in a public space, and I'm, I'm aware of the fact that women are making active choices when it comes to their choosing their partners or falling in love, then it create, makes me uncomfortable. Now, um, when it comes to sex rule and the global right, for example, um, this kind of uh, deterritorialized panic policing of female populations is not something which is unusual. For example, you, uh, the Camellia, which is like the women's wing of the KKK, has been long involved in this kind of racial policing of uh, black women and to ensure that you know that there is a separation between white men and black women. The neo-Nazis in Europe, for example, have a very clear idea about the fact that they are moral policing Muslim women because they don't want the racial mixing between Muslim women and white men. And you have mothers against aliens, again, in the US, for example, who are against Hispanic women. As, as a matter of fact, they're considered to be a vigilante group which actively kill Hispanic women and children, which is about the fact that you know, they don't want racial mixing between Hispanic women and, uh, and white men. Um, when these kind of agendas of moral policing, for example, and they are picked up by the state, 
is picked up as a state agenda, it's not just a political end. So it's, this is not just about the state exerting its power over people or, for, or citizenry or about migration. It very much fits, feeds into a cultural imaginary about purity which is that there has to be purity of the, within the territorial border. For example, Trump's idea of touting this white nostalgia, which was very much about the fact that why don't we go back to a past where everybody was white and you didn't have to deal with the complexity of multiculturalism. Am I going to hu hug a Muslim woman or shake hands with her? Or like, you know, ha having to find out about other cultures, other foods, when like, you know, your son goes off and brings in like a Middle Eastern woman into my family. So this kind of white nostalgia, which is that you know, just, just to be relaxed in purity. It's very much part of, the, of Hindu nationalism in India as well, which also touts this Hindu golden past, which was about the fact that, oh, everybody was Hindu. And you just did not have to deal with like, you know, minority Muslims, you did not have to de deal with minority Christians or Buddhists or Jains, life was better. So uh, part of it is that part of this discussion is about the emerging, emerging treatment state. And this has been something which has been developed by Naomi Klein, for example, for a long period of time, where, um, where a lot of authors, they talk about the fact that the way that the state presents itself, and this is very true in the context of the global south, is that when it comes to women's lust, women's love, women being transgressive in the context of their intimacy, then it's a social illness. And it's the state treats itself as a diagnostic state, that we are doctors. We are not like, you know, hardcore coercive state mechanisms. We are doctors. So what we are going to do is that we are going to treat this social condition and that the law which has come into place is a way in which to treat the society and cure it of its social ills. Love Jihad in India is a very good example of that, which talks about the fact that um, there are just too many Hindu women marrying Muslim men. And this context, it's called love jihad, which is that to ensure that it feeds into the discussion around global terrorism, which is that Muslims now don't necessarily want to always like, you know, use bombs and blasts and terrorist activities to show their, uh, sh to show their prominence, because there's so much of like, you know, state backlash against that. So this is a underground movement, which is called love jihad, which is that you dress up as an attractive Muslim man, you go around seducing Hindu women, and you ensure that you convert them to Islam after marriage. And since you're allowed four marriages, you can do this four times in your life. So you can see that there's a lot of activism around uh, love jihad. The, the poster on top is an active poster of, uh, of the anti-love jihad movement, which shows that there is a Hindu woman who is being driven away from a Hindu temple with a Muslim Muslim guy on a motorbike. And you can actually email them, uh, sort of, you know, this is like a, or like, you know, at the anti love jihad squads, and they will take care of your problem. So, this thing about the anti love jihad is couched in, in India's anti conversion law. So this is a this is a case of like a, what is considered to be a moral crisis, which is within the family, which is within the domestic sphere, and how that is picked up by the state. So the state has a law which says that if a woman marries and she converts to Islam, then she will return be returned to her family. So whether you do it when you're 30 or 40, your age, your sexual agency does not matter. You are allowed to be plucked out of that marriage and to be returned to your father, who's the original owner of the girl child. So this move becomes from formal governance, which is, which is communities manage these kind of uh, transgressions to for formal governance. But what it does produce, and this is something again which is, which is related to Laura Stoke, is that it produced this idea of the like, new geographies of fear, which is that when there is like so much over governing of sex and sexuality and female bodies, there is there it you know it's a bit like the the Trumpian idea of nostalgia where there is a fear of it. And then if you meet a Muslim man and you fall in love, you just think, if I don't have enough enough resources, I'm, I don't come from an affluent background, I'm not politically correct, I may as well not marry this man. I may as well go and marry a man who has been chosen by my family and choose a simpler life. So I'm gonna go leave that and let Matthias take over. There we go.
Well, thanks so much for having the opportunity to um, yeah, both be here, Robin, and also to um, comment a bit on your talk here now, Laura. Um, so the way I approach this is basically to think about how I could engage my PhD research with your work here on, on sex and gender rule. I hope it's not too much of a stretch. Um, you can call me out right afterwards if it is. Um, but yeah, so what I looked into in, in my PhD research is basically the Iraq war and um, a database of um, images of the Iraq war to um, say something about the complex gendered politics of the intervention and the ongoing, not ongoing, but the following occupation of Iraq between 2003 and 2012. And I should also say perhaps briefly that this project has been part of a um, project um, funded by the Danish Research Fund, the DFF, and which, which with the name Bodies as Battleground, Gender, Images and International Security, which is devoted to both building theory um, about yeah, gender and international security and images, but also providing analysis. So the way I, I think this actually relates quite well also with um, what we just heard um, from, from Laura is that um, I look a lot into soldiering and into the military. So as Laura also said in her talk, um, you know, um, this, this, this always relates to questions about who protects whom, and soldiering is still about protecting a feminist other in, in oversimplified terms, and how that also relates to state control and, 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 and reproduction. So in particular, this um, in my PhD research makes me look at um, the Western policies of intervention and counterinsurgency, but also um, the army, the armed forces, um, generally as um, an institution um, as an in that, that regulates sex and gender. So um, I look into counterinsurgency policy and how it realizes and reinforces gendered and sexist assumptions of the role of men and women, both with regards to combatants, non-combatants, um, interveners, um, Iraqis, but also how, yeah, then basically the armed forces are an institution that is shaped by sex and gender rule. And that particularly then makes me turn to the army base as a site of inquiry in my research. So what I sketch in my own research is um, engaging with images from the family home where um, intervening forces um, encounter Iraqis and um, how, that is how, how that enables us to say something about the gendered politics of the Iraq war and the army base as another site um, to make an argument about how um, basically sex and gender is regulated in, in the institution of the armed forces and um, yeah, making an engagement through images uh, of the army base here. So as I said, I'm a visual IR scholar, so I work with um, images and I approach images um, as a way also of theorizing. So it is about how, um, you know, how um, images can can also be a, w a window into, um, for instance, saying something about the gendered and, um, and sexualized politics of the Iraq war. So in one of my um, sites of inquiry of my um, PhD research, I look at the family home and the encounter between um, occupational forces and Iraqis and how, how this is encounter is, for instance, um, structured when we bring the intertext of, of counterinsurgency policy to it, how this um, relies and reinforces certain, um, yeah, basically gendered assumptions about the role of Iraqis, but also um, the role of the occupational forces. So um, in, in on this slide here, we can see a photograph taken by Johan Spanner as published in the um, Danish paper Berlingske and a uh, photograph taken by Darko Bandage as published on the front page of El Pais. And yeah, both encounters um, are taking place in the Iraqi family home, one in a living room, the other one in a kitchen. And well, I kind of could say a lot of this about this now, but the one thing I, I briefly want to emphasize here, also um, in relation to, to Laura's talk we just, we just had, is that, um, that basically counterinsurgency policy relied on um, 
gendered stereotypes of the roles of men and women. So it, for instance, particularly introduced women and the management of female sex and sexuality to the secret of the success of um, counterinsurgency. So, for instance, um, those people that drafted the um, the counterinsurgency policies, such as um, David Kilcullen, I think that's how I pronounce him, I'm actually still not sure, but he's one of the sort of famous people behind counterinsurgency policy. He, um, in, 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 the in his manuals, we read things such as, um, you should c covet your enemy's wife, or you should win the women, and then you own the family unit. And if you own the, fam own the family and you take a big step forward in mobilizing the population. So I think this all relates um, nicely to also the gendered and sex, um, sexist rule as translated into, um, into a specific foreign policy of counterinsurgency policy here. And yeah, maybe maybe one interesting thing to say also in terms of the constitution of women, for instance, in, in, in an image such as one on El Pais, is that, for instance, the counterinsurgency policy um, gives a much more um, a agentic role to women than, for instance, com when, when reading this through an interventionist policy intertext. So while the interventionist policy intertext would um, would would communicate along a, a, a sort of narrative of you know saving the women from the Iraqis, the counterinsurgency intertext would always give a more agentic role to women in that context because um, women are both the secrets to winning the hearts and minds, um, but they're also um, basically therefore partaking in the counterinsurgency and they're almost sort of insurgents um, themselves. That's just maybe to say a bit more of how I approach the image through bringing different intertexts to the image through also always challenging um, who those women are rather than um, narrowing down the meaning. Well, let me just briefly um, move to my next slide where we um, speak a bit more about, where I speak a bit more about um, yeah, the military staff and their um, well, basically, how 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 the the army, uh, the armed forces as an institution regulate um, both love, sex, desire, and gender. Um, that is here an image from an army base in Iraq, um, the forward operating base um, called Camp Manhattan. And on this image, we can see um, soldiers um, hanging out in a telephone booth. And I basically. At here I turn my attention to how the army institutionally regulates um, love and desire, and again, how this um, basically fosters a heteron heteronormative model of love to spouses um, th through flagging out the institutional environment of the base um, as characterized both by a homophobic culture, but also um, the always homosocial relations to comrades. So I show here how, you know, the army is an institution, manages the conjugal bonds between spouses, um, domestic coupling through marriage, but also offers, for instance, support for relocation at the home base. So it's really to show how the army as an institution regulates um, sex and gender. But also how it regulates, and I think the image here is a nice window into this, how it regulates privacy and intimacy. Because on the one hand, we can picture or think imagine from this that the soldiers are speaking to their spouses at home, which we might imagine as a sort of intimate conversation, but I think we can also um, sort of already challenge how this is not intimate, right? Because everybody, I have some other photos from the same series, there's literally soldiers after soldiers sit sitting next to each other, so it is also um, perhaps much less intimate than we would think of. And and um, when we bring this into text of this publication to the, the reading, we also get to challenge how, um, how actually a lot of the soldiers don't have anybody to call, perhaps because of their um, class background, which actually means that, um, yeah, a lot of the friends that are, for instance, cited in this article, uh, sorry, uh, how they speak about their friends is that they're all in prison and so on. So it, it, it kind of foregrounds also this, 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 this class location of soldiering. Yeah, so that was my part and thanks so much.
okay. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> but Amelia's waving. The slide? Okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, it's been a very interesting hour, and now we have a good deal of time for open discussion, questions, and responses to any of our speakers, so the floor is open. And uh, Valentina. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, presentation. It was great. I'm super excited. But, and I have a, a lot of questions, actually. But I'm just going to uh, start with two, if there is more time, maybe later. But, uh, so uh, Laura, uh, Laura, or Laura, how do you pronounce it? Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Italian. I just go automatically with Laura. <laughs> uh, so I, I was, I'm just going to to flip your argument a tiny bit, because uh, you say that uh, if sex rule uh, build and maintain the state, then does sex unruliness uh, have the potential to disrupt it? And uh, so it's like sex positivity, queerness, or uh, maybe even a wider focus on pleasure and uh, a desire a uh, place for resistance? And how would it work? And my second question is related, so I'm gonna just sl slide it in. And it is also kind of a bit of a uh, challenge because like, I understand, like, I totally agree with your point of view about the fact that uh, it's kind of estranging to look at sexuality as something that we see so intimately being uh, yeah, dissected this way when it comes like, to uh, the state approach to regulation. But then it's, uh, um, but it's going back to uh, normalization, privatization, and so focusing on the act versus the identity uh, conducive to social change or is transgression necessary for political action? Yeah, thank you. You did now, right? Okay, sweet. Um, clearly, I'm very good at using this technology. Um, okay, so to the first question, certainly the state as an institution seems generally threatened by sex unruliness, right? Like one of the things where airport security assemblages require the identification of a biological sex because somehow they associate not identifying one with insecurity when actually statistically it's the opposite, um, right? Like seems to suggest that the state thinks that sex unruliness is a threat to it. Now whether it is or not, I don't know, right? I'd like it to be, but I also think that so back, I'm going to try and make this short, but back like 25 years ago when I was having the argument with Catherine McKinnon about uh, whether or not all heterosexual sex is rape, right? Like, I, my argument was, well, when I do the opposite just to, like, transgress what I'm supposed to be doing, is that really any more consent building than the thing that I do because I'm supposed to be doing it? Right, like, and so I fear a little bit that, like, I don't know how you organize rebellion for rebellion's sake. I think I might be making that noise, and I'm not sure how. Maybe I'll, okay, there we go. Maybe I won't make that noise now. Does that work better? Um, but yeah, so, so yes, but, right, I think is part of the problem. And I think that that, you know, like, also has a lot to do with kind of the link to the second question where I think like these matrices are so complicated, right? That like to me it's tough to, I'm always paralyzed by the, by the then so what do you do question, um, right? Like because I feel like, yeah, I think that my initial interest in gender and security was actually about the sanctions regime in Iraq in the 1990s, right? And like, there was always the question, what is the feminist alternative? And it's like, well, I don't know, deconstruct it, apologize, pay back all the money, pay, you know, like, you know, it, things that would never happen, right? Like, and I think that's one of the tough things about some of these things is no, the privatization model doesn't interest me at all. I think I would like it if the state had nothing to do with any of this. Right, of course, that's not a thing that's ever gonna happen. Um, but I think like it would be nice if the state didn't get to judge the genuineness of your relationship at all, uh, much less on identity versus sex act versus whatever, right? Um, and so to me, like, I think that part is a problem. I think that 
built up in the state's like gendered, racialized, and sexualized lack of trust, right? Like people are assumed to be lying, and the people who are assumed to be lying are women, queers, and people of some racial identification that the state doesn't want, right? Like, whereas, like, in some very simple sense, the people who look and act like we want them to, whoever the we is, don't even get asked these questions, right? Like, and so I think that that's, like, most of the problem is both that the state gets to judge and then the, the state chooses who they will judge on biased, like, kind of criterion or whatever. And, you know, so when I said that, I think that, you know, I use I in the talk because it works in terms of sexual relationships. You know, I, I think that, like, for me, no one ever asks, right? Because there's an assumed heteronormativity. There's the privilege of whiteness. And so, like... When I applied for indefinite leave to remain in the UK, I had broken just about every rule that is required to get indefinite leave to remain in the UK, and it didn't matter. Um, and none of that was relationship-based, but it didn't matter because I'm not the person they want to kick out, right? Um, and I think that that's something that's really important to pay attention to in these major cities. Is it's the enforcement of these things is not random. Um, I just had a, a couple of comments, which was actually in response to uh, some some of the things that we were talking about, uh, sex and unruliness. And I was thinking about the fact that how, in the context of uh, the post-colony, for example, a lot of this unruliness it has was historically uh, was historically controlled by colonial law. And uh, so it was. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking in the context of India, for example, all these all these laws which were about like you know public pornography and anti-prostitution and anti-sodomy and anti-gay uh, relationships, etc. It actually emerged in the context of the colonial law, and then it kind of like you know stayed on for 200 years, and and now you have like a new set of laws which are being added to it. So it's like um, so there is no uh, so there are so many continuities that people don't look at, for example, things like the anti-conversion law or uh, or as as something which is uh, which is something which is new or like a, or it's something which is like excessively produced by the state um, so there's a, the critique against it uh, is actually very low because the population has been very used like the, to these kind of laws and and to be the, the to be the recipients of these laws so there is not a lot of critique or or sort of you know uh, protest uh, which comes in from the citizenry except from like you know very uh, secular politically aware uh, elite group of people who are against this kind of uh, uh, th this kind of imposition so uh, the average citizen the 1.3 billion people they've been under colonial law for 200 years so for them it's like you know th this idea of what constitutes transgression is is quite fuzzy um, but I, um, I just wanted to add something which is interesting in the context of this, uh, this kind of uh, sex unruliness is that a large part of uh, this, this kind of this, this discussion about like controlling sex is because of, of population control measures in the global south. So it has uh, the state has retained the right to talk about sex and to be in your bedroom and to control your reproductive behavior because it has always been under this idea that if there is a population explosion, then the GDP is going to be in crisis and uh, sort of and sort of you will stop getting international aid because it's it's going to be wasted on your country and you have to come across as a modern state if you actually have uh, population control measures. So this was an interesting way in which the state, for example, gained access to intimacy and legitimized it internally and externally as well. Thanks so much for uh, for a great talk, Laura. Um, I had two questions. Uh, the, the first is, is sort of inspired by your publisher's uh, critique in the sense of like, what sticks from one period to another? And, and I mean, as a lawyer, of course, you tend to see that lots of normative uh, constructs have sort of a certain kind of staying power, stickiness over time. <coughs> and I just sort of like for one example of you that I think sort of works as a wonderful counter example to the kind of uh, marriage treaties and sort of inclusion through marriage. Of course, 
in, in Denmark and many other countries, we still, from colonial times, have the so-called sailor law as part of Danish citizenship law, which means that you apply your sanguine principle. If you have a Danish mother, you are automatically granted Danish citizenship. If you have only a male father, uh, you have to go through a special application procedure. So there's a kind of resistance towards citizenship that is also clearly gender-based. Um, and and the second question uh, is, I mean, when you talk about the state and, and the sort of gender politics around asylum, migration, etc., I'm, I'm, of course, interested also in this sort of space for contestation um, and to what extent that forms part of your project. So, for instance, the, there's a number of principal cases concerning the LGBT asylum seekers that you also mentioned, which actually set some at least some boundaries in terms of what kind of questions and what kind of techniques um, asylum case workers could apply in, in testing for sexuality uh, that would be relevant, these sort of things. And ages ago, we did a, a project here that used, we basically saw a lot of advertisements for marriage uh, that, that was clearly sort of in order to circumvent and, and try to regularize and, and sort of Spanish advertisements online saying, no sex, no bullshit, just papers, etc. And to, to what extent are these things also, of course, the, the state related, and, and to what extent can you account for them in, in your project? Yeah, I mean, so my publisher is ultimately going to win the battle, largely because currently the book is 600,000 words. Um, and so it being three books makes it easier than it being one book. Um, and I'm lazy. Um, so ultimately they're going to win. Um, but uh, maybe the article version is where they won't win. Um, and, and to me, I think that, so for example, I see a link between maternal linked citizenship and like the stories in the 16th century of the female consort as the womb of the state. Right, like where somehow, like in like in whose person the child gestates, right, is like a signification of who is the state, but like the person who's doing the gestating actually only matters as the gestator, right, in that language rather than like as a person themselves, and so I think like. There are links. I mean, so in the book, the the treaty marriage cases are actually uh, there's the one in the the Franco Spanish War, uh, the one in uh, between England and Spain with Catherine Arthur Arthur Henry and the end of Catholicism in uh, England. Um, but the other three cases are outside the West. Um, there's one of a transition in the Mughal Empire, which was largely dictated by a father-in-law relationship, um, when a princess bestowal in the move between the Ming and Qing dynasties in China, um, where actually that was annexation of men into the woman's family, um, and then one in a transition in uh, the Ethiopian Empire um, in the uh, 19th century. Um, and in all of those cases, there's different rules about sex and different views about legitimacy and different understandings of relationships. But in all of them, sexual relationships have both legal and significatory status in the making and consolidation of the state. And so I want to make an argument that much like gendering is across global politics, right? Like the genderings differ. They differ a lot by time, they differ a lot by place, they differ a lot by culture, but they're always there. And I think that the same can be understood as sexu around sexual signification and borders. That like the situations and the stories around sex and sexuality differ a lot, but they're always there. Um, and I think that that might be the important part to me. I don't think the project has, so like, I think that the citizenship project is interested in some of these legal battles, although I think it's much more interested in the state, this, the stake the state takes in them. That was good English. English mm -hmm. is my first language, it's very sad. <laughs> um, but like, so like I'm interested in like the state's defense, right? Because I'm interested in the state's self-imaginary being staked in them even where the state loses, right? Like, and so I think it's very interesting, like how the state uses them to tell a story of itself. Um, and like the South Korean case is really interesting there too, 
Um, but I'm going to shut up because I've been talking for too long now. Um, I found the, the notion of um, the kind of geopolitics of birth really interesting. And um, obviously it's something that's always been a, um, a massive thread and something so contested. But I feel like recently... Um, the, the kind of narratives around it have become especially contested with um, the obviously the falling birth rate in in the global north and how this has been a massive part of kind of far right discourse like the great replacement theory and then on the other side the kind of eco fascist narrative of population control and um, um, this might be a difficult question but I was wondering where in the kind of era of both climate emergency and also um, increasing salience of the far right where you see this um how you see this kind of contestation of the geopolitics of birth going on totally kind of opposing solutions both that are so like unbelievably kind of charged in such a like sexual and gendered and security based way um Okay, so I'll give you an ivory tower answer and then a real one. Uh, my ivory tower answer is I'm with Lee Edelman. Stop all this reproduction stuff at all. Um, but, uh, but I realize that that is both intellectually deeply problematic and politically even worse. So, um, so I won't stick with that. Um, but I do think it's an interesting foil, right, to ask the question of what, for what purpose we are obsessed with what the world will look like 50 years from now. Right, because like everyone is like in some way or another, right? And I think that that isn't like, I think that isn't necessarily a normative given, right? And I think that that might be a good place to start. But I mean, in, in a much more serious tone, I think that like the fundamental problem is this link between control of sexuality and understandings of political success, right? Because like, if complete opposite sides of the political spectrum want to control the same thing to do the same thing, right, then like that control link becomes a lot of the problem, right, where like it's only because we think that this is something that is controllable, right, and also something where the people who can be like who we want to control like are deserving of being controlled, right? So with certain assumptions about women's bodies and especially about racialized women's bodies, right? Like are necessary to make that discourse possible. And to me, I might start in attacking it there and then kind of unfold it from there. And I think that like, you know, especially when it comes to like the far right in the global north, you know, I mean, it's, it's fundamentally racism but it's a reproductive racism that it's important to highlight because I don't think that's the only place reproductive racism takes place, right? I think that a lot of this, like, we don't call these people social Darwinist anymore, but they are, right? And I think that's really important to pay attention to. Uh, um, if everyone can hear me, I'm happy to not use the mic. Oh, I beg your pardon, all right, fine. Um, so there are, uh, several points in your talk where you say something to the effect of, and I don't know why the state would care about this thing, and I share with you a kind of prurient sense that this is none of their business. Um, and I was sort of wondering whether or not you and I are the weirdos in that context, right? That thinking that sex is none of the state's business is a kind of affect of godless atheists, and no one else thinks this, mm. right? And so in your presentation about treaty marriage, Right, many of these examples are about making sure that you have a Catholic or a Protestant heir. Right, that's these. These are about systems of spiritual religious regulation, and that's why it's very important that James of Scotland marries Anne of Denmark in 1590 because we need to make it secure for the Reformed faith. But it does not matter that James fucks around with loads of men. That is just not important at all. Um, and similarly, yeah, you know, we talk about all of this asylum stuff. We talk about, you know. Uh, the idea that this might be racialized, but actually, I kind of agree with you when you're like, this is just about keeping Muslims out, isn't it? So in fact, a kind of central concept here seems to be religion. I, I have a similar sense to you that this is none of your business whenever I hear Vladimir Putin endlessly bring up gay people. I have a sort of moment where I'm like, surely he can't care that much. Can he? 
But he seems to, right? Like he, he keeps bringing it up by his own by his own words. The idea that the West is threatening him with homosexuality seems to be a very important issue to him. So I'm wondering if a kind of central organizing concept here is religion running through all of these cases. Or indeed love jihad for that matter. <laughs> I think in some of them it matters more than others. Like in, so like in in two of my cases, there's there's a, like little to no influence of religion. So like in the Chinese case, there's there's very little influence of religion, and in the Muggle case, like religion is something by which they are bothered every once in a while, essentially. Um, like in in the one case I'm looking at, not across the empire, because actually later it becomes much more religious, right? Um, but but at the time I'm looking at it, it is it is uh, not particularly interested in religion. Um, so like interestingly enough, so like it is and it isn't, right? So like in the case of James the first, right? It does matter that he married the nice Protestant girl. However, if he screwed around with other nice Protestant girls who had children, they wouldn't be heirs. Right, like so, there is also kind of some signification around fidelity that is reproductive because it doesn't actually matter that he screws around with a bunch of men, right? But then it actually does matter that Louis the Thirteenth screws around with a bunch of men because he can't produce an heir because he doesn't want to screw around with women at all, right? And so Louis the Fourteenth has to go screw around with a bunch of women to prove that he can, right? Like, and so it's a very interesting, like, so the signif, like, so. The homosexual sex acts are fine so long as they don't interfere with heterosexual sex acts, right? But once they do, then all of a sudden there's this narrative that like isn't cool, right? Um, and I think that the the laws that attempt to use homophobia as a proxy to keep out Muslim people are racialized as much as they are religious, right? Like I like I think that that like actually has a pretty significant kind of role in the desire in European countries to police kind of migration on that front. Um, so like, I think it's, I think the, the difficult thing about this is that it's a constellation of things. I mean, I do think like, it certainly helps being a militant atheist, not thinking that the government should be in my sex life, right? Um, uh, because like, I grew up around everyone who thought the government should be in your sex life because they were all Southern Baptist and, you know, the government should be in your drinking life and your dancing life and all of those great things too, right? Um, but I do think that like, so like I'm half joking when I say I don't know why the state cares because like I do know why the state cares, right? But like I also think that like if the state weren't as invested in these things, it would be better for states and for people. Um, and like, you know, I, I will not convince the state of that. Maybe I will convince the people, we'll see. But. Patria, do you also want to respond to this? Oh, okay, yes. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay. Um, I, I do agree with you because I think in the context of uh, a lot of the countries in the global south, it is about uh, sort of sustaining religion and the purity of religion within society, which is the one of the primary reasons why the state regulates marriage and sex. So just in the context of uh, love jihad, for example, um, in the context of India, the, it, the law is about the fact that only Muslims in India are allowed to follow Sharia. And all other religions come under something which is called Uniform Civil Code, uh, which, was the, which is the British law, and under which you're allowed to marry one time. And it is only the Muslims who are allowed to marry four times. So their logic I is a demographic logic, which is that <coughs> if you are a Hindu man and you've married once, then probably in your lifetime you can have like six, seven, eight children. But if you are a Muslim man and you've married four times, and you in your life if you have 10 children from each wife, then you have 40 children. So it's a particular victimhood which is sort of you know suffered by the sort of the majoritarian uh, political scenario, which is that eventually the Muslims will lead the take over the world because demographically they're going to be more than other other religions. And in the context of India, it's about the fact that only uh, India, the Hindus only have India, while Muslims have many other countries, Christians have many other countries to be in. So it's really important to pr protect the Hindu majority in, in the context of India. So I think that that kind of uh, you know idea of, uh, of a pure Hindu land, the undivided Hindu land, it very much protects protects the state 
from any kind of critique, for example, or uh, which we, from uh, from average people. But I did want to talk a little bit about the geopolitics of birth, if that's okay which is that I find it really interesting because uh, there's so much of discourse which is about the fact that how women from the global south, they migrate to the north and they quickly deliver a child in that country because it gives them citizenship in and allows them to carry on and, and stay, uh, stay in that country. Uh, but if you actually look at what's going on in the global south right now, there's a lot of literature which is coming out right now that there's an enormous falling of birth rate even in the global south. So Korea, for example, is now has one of the lowest birth rates in the, in the world because women are having 0.5 children. Because, uh, and if you look at, uh, and I'm just thinking in the context of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, there's all this uh, literature which is about like urban women have a declining birth rate of 60%. And there are lots of women who are going through life child-free, maybe because they are ecologically aware and it's part of their environmental politics, but also because uh, uh, people are exhausted. You know, it's because everybody just wants to earn money and have enough money to go through life and uh, and not take on the responsibility of, uh, you know, bringing, bringing children in this world. So this is also interesting in the context that how the global, so many countries of the global north still stereotype the fact that there are all these women who are coming into the global north who want to deliver a child here, drop a child here and stay on here. While if you look at the statistics in the global south, it's like actually about the fact that women are not interested, large populations of rural women, urban women, really not interested in having in, any more children. I'm going to insert myself here with a couple of questions. One is um, the theme we've been talking about with sex uh, rules and uh, the state uh, is around the uh, legitimacy, um, consummation, um, and uh, also, uh, Atrey, where you're talking about the moral policing. What is uh, legitimate sex? Um, uh, and it occurs to me that you could tell the same story about uh, sexual violence, how sexual violence is also part of this state-making, group-making, uh, creation of borders. And since, Laura, you were uh, come, cur coming to this notion of the state imaginary, then I'm curious, is it, would you then think this is the same imaginary that comes through law giving and law breaking? Or, um, and if so, uh, are you inclined to think as McKinnon might, that the law giving is itself a form of sexual violence? On, right? Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, so interestingly, so in, in a number of these treaty marriage consummations, I think we're, we're questionably consensual. Um, I think that like, in fact, I think that they would be understood as non-consensual now, right? Um, uh, and often actually people involved in treaty marriages were given sex coaches, um, which was also non-consensual. Right, so there was a lot of, so like a lot of this stuff isn't separable from sexual violence, right? Like, and like in the in the Chinese case, consorts were forced to audition, right? Like, and in the in the like, almost in all of these cases, kind of pre now or whatever, like, you know, none of the women are like, ooh, sign me up for that. Or if they are, then they're like, ooh, sign me up for that because like that's my purpose, right? Like or something like that. Like Catherine of Aragon was very much like, sign me up for that. But it wasn't like, I would like to marry Arthur or Henry. It was like, I would like to be an ambassador of the Spanish state in this way, right? Like, so like, I don't think, so like, I think there's, there's the intersection of this and violence, right? And like, you know, when we were talking about selling marriages like you know and like those people who attempt to defraud kind of marriage partner migration law a lot of that is quite violent as well um it starts as a capitalist like exchange but like often the rules are changed in the middle and there's a lot of violence kind of among it so th so there's there's an intersection of these things in sexual violence right um but also like it kind of goes hand in hand i think where like if sex is in something to which when has like an attachment at the state level, then, you know, I think like Maria Stern and Maria Erickson Baas write about this very well. It says like, you know, sexual violence in war is sexual too, right? Like, and 
and it is sexual in a way that the sexuality is an important part of the weapon, right? And I think that those are tied to kind of the same state imaginary. Um, in terms of this question about whether law giving is also the violence, yeah. But then like, but I don't know, I think like the part where I maybe part about it a little bit, right, is I'm not sure there's a such thing as nonviolence. And so to me, I'm more interested in how much violence is being done in what direction and who's being held responsible for it than I am in is this thing nonviolent to begin with. Because like I think, I think me sitting here talking has violences in it, right? And it's just a question of acknowledging and taking responsibility for those and kind of how rather than like suggesting that there's like a nonviolent alternative, right? So to me, it's a question of is law giving less violent than whatever the alternatives would be? I'm not sure, but I think that's how I'd frame it. Matthias, do you want to speak to that in terms of your work on vulnerability? Yeah, could, could you just briefly repeat sort of the, the overall framing of the question? <laughs> Uh, the question was, uh, we've been talking about um, uh, legitimate um, uh, consummation, uh, in both historically and border crossing. And uh, as I've done so much work with issues of sexual violence and seen se many of these same processes yeah, yeah, in terms yeah. of what makes nationalities, groups, identities, the same concepts of honor are being um, are being uh, uh, activated in these. It was a question of the connection between the legitimate and the non-legitimate, um, or is the violence also, uh, is, that the, is that a form of law making? Is the uh, law making a form of violence? Um, and I know this is connected to more general discussions about vulnerability, also your casework in Iraq. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, I'll try to speak a bit to it. Um, so, of course, if we speak about sexual violence um, and also with regards to the images I study in the wartime family home, um, you know, it relates to a larger research agenda, I guess, within feminist era on wartime rape and questions of sexual violence, right? So, also, yeah, it's just been a long research agenda, I guess, in feminist era on the relation between how, um, you know, rape comes into and sort of into a gendered security problems through the nation rather than perhaps necessarily through being a gendered security problem where the individual sort of um, gendered based um, problem of a woman would be addressed through for instance the question of the international intervention but that and then again raises a question of violence i guess with regards to the question of intervening or non-intervening I'm thinking a bit of Lynn Hansen's work on gender nation rape with regards to the Bosnian war here. So yeah, that's that's how I would kind of tackle this question and think along those lines. I'm not sure if it is a really su <laughs> sufficient answer here, but those are some thoughts I have. Atri, did you want to step in there? I want to say something, <laughs> I think I may be like, <laughs> I'll just calm down. Okay, okay uh, then my second question uh, was, at the end, you said this was your theory, Laura, and that was the uh, you know what you wanted uh, more input in. But you know you didn't give us so much uh, uh, of your uh, hints about how you're working with that. But you did send a paper in advance, <laughs> and so I know you're talking about uh, this double meaning of sex rules, rules as the practices, informal and formal, and uh, uh, various constellations and also rules in the sense of that which uh, you say distribute privilege and patterns of subordination. I was wondering if you could flesh that out a little more for this and what that means about how you would think about a theory of power. Um, do all forms of rules create subordinations and exclusions? Uh, is this based on some kind of um, a theory of, uh, of dominance in terms of race, uh, class, uh, gender, uh, and its relation to uh, racialization? Uh, I don't know. Um, no, let me, t let me try to be a little better than that anyway. Um, although I think I'm, I'm fundamentally okay with the I don't know part of the answer. Um, 
okay so yeah so like i think that like i mean rules in two different ways one is like formal rules um the existence of laws the existence of international institutions um the existence of rules within institutions right which are often not treated as laws but then they are often kind of what dictates institutional behavior um so like the ways in which uh, privilege is formally kind of meted out um, in the legal structure, um, but then also the related significations, right? Where like, for example, if we have a law that says like legitimate married couples can migrate to my state, right? Then like the significations around that are consonant with it, but multiple around it. Right. And so those are also, in my view, kind of and in Nick's view rules, which are kind of like discourses and social norms that become a thing that is expected. Right. So like it's not like necessarily punitively enforced, although sometimes it is. Um, and so this constellation of rules and different types of rules goes together. Right. And to me then like the thing that about Nick's work that speaks to me is they're more than a sum of their parts, right? And that's the thing that I'm interested in about this is that I feel like these varieties of ways in which the state signifies the importance of sex acts for the constitution and enforcement of borders are together more than a sum of their parts. Um, and the thing that they are that is more than a sum of their parts is that like the border cannot be divorced from sex and sexuality i think is kind of like where i end up on that um you know and in terms of this question of like matrices of domination i like in previous work i've talked about and i think it's it's messy but it, it helps a little bit like there are gendered orders right that are like primarily done on the basis of gender right like and then there are gendered orders which are ones that have some pri other primary structural factor of domination but are often talked about in gendered terms so like there's a lot of good feminist work on the ways in which Orientalism is gendered, for example, right? Um, so it's not based on gender, but it does have gender as I guess Spike Peterson would call valorization and devalorization, right? Um, and then there's the notion that order itself may be gendered. Um, and I think that those are kind of like the three ways in which I went to engage this, but I don't think theoretically I've gotten to exactly what that means for this particular project. So I don't know. Okay, are there any final questions from the audience? Yeah, Naya. Yeah, thank you for a really great presentation and discussion. So I was wondering about uh, your presentation. You went from like the treaty marriages, not consensual to the state asking all kind of uh, uh, horrible questions in relation to asylum seekers and I was thinking something that is happening in between those two time periods is the ideal of romantic love uh, and how that is related to certain notions of how sex should be in relation to that uh, and I was wondering do you in your book I mean is that something you are looking at because it goes kind of in between these kind of uh, how marriage is organized on consensual that you have the princes and princesses and probably also for uh, normal people so to speak and then this very I mean the more recent obsession with uh, uh, with asylum seekers um, etc there's something in between there lots of things actually but romantic love I think is one of them the ideal of that Yeah, I totally agree. Um, cynically, it's probably something I think I can avoid by breaking it up into a couple of books, uh, or I can just skip the middle part. Uh, might work out, uh, perhaps analytically not that great a plot. Um, so I think interestingly enough, uh, the thing that makes monogamy matter in sexual significations of current marriage partner migrations is that sex is a symbol of love. <laughs> 
right? Which is interesting because it relates to the asexual couples not counting, right? So they can't love each other if they don't want to have sex with each other, right? Like, um, but like, it is also that it's understood that sex is something different in a monogamous relationship than it is outside of it. So like even, you know, like, so when you cheat, then you cheapen sex, which is why it doesn't count, like why it counts less when you cheat, right? And these things are all like significations related to the primary way in which love dignifies, like, and you know, when I said that there's more to the denial of arranged marriages than sex, it's also about that, which is like this civilized, uncivilized dichotomy where civilized people marry for love and uncivilized people don't, which is a load of crap, right? But like, in some sense, like, love has become the thing by which sexual relationships are measured, right? Um, and I think that that was not the case previously. Reproduction was the thing by which sexual relationships were measured, right? And so I think that that's a very interesting change that is strongly reflected in like the ways that sex has different significations now than then. And I think that's an important point, but mostly I'm going to try to skip it. I think I saw one final question. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I've actually in, I've been listening to your conversation. I've been very, very convinced by the way, by the idea of the, the, the sum of the whole, it's, it's, it's more than that, right? And actually the, the entry point, I think, for your theoretical discussion. But I really liked, um, I think, many parts of the discussion that in a way, for me, kind of brought back issues about reproduction. And, and that and how far that is linked. I think even your response now was like, so this is it's moving from reproduction to, to law, right? But I wondered a bit whether you could flesh out conceptually kind of what part of the whole of the sum is then related to reproduction, right? And what is it that's not there, like what's not covered by that? But also in the way in which you historically have been talking about kind of how, how is this relevant again um, uh, in terms of why the state is interested in this. It, it seems that reproduction is kind of creeping or somewhere in the background. And I wonder whether you could kind of highlight that a bit more. That that's like one of the things. So I've had problems with two things that I didn't come to write about and then ended up somehow having to write about. One is reproduction and the other is marriage. I had no interest in either one when I started this project. Um, still intellectually have trouble having interest in either one, but I'm getting there. Um, right. Uh, and, and both, you can't write about any of this stuff without both concepts, right? I mean, but I think like, it's important to suggest that it's actually not reducible to that, right? Because like, so for example, in contempt, so like in contemporary marriage partner migration law and asylum law, right? Like these things are enforced regardless of interest in reproduction, right? And regardless of ca capacity for reproduction, right? Like, and you know, there are states that allow, for example, LGBTQ asylum that don't allow queer adoption. Right. So literally they're like letting people in that in theory will never have children. Right. Like, but they're still concerned. Right. Um, and that concerning is, I think, about cultural social reproduction as opposed to biological reproduction. Right. It's like what my state looks like isn't just what children it has. Right. Like, and I think that kind of another place where this ends up mattering is that reproduction itself is not theoretically flat. Right. Like in some sense, like states are all concerned with who reproduces. Right. But like the contemporary example of like some states want their people to make more children and some states want their people to make less children suggests that like the production of children has different significations at different times for different reasons. So like the Ming, the Qing dynasty people that I'm interested in uh, were interested in making girl children for the purposes of getting boy kind of subordinate princes with the girl children, right? Whereas like some of the, and they weren't uninterested in boy children, but they were interested specifically in girl children. Whereas like, you know, a lot of these Western, uh, kind of Western European treaty marriages were interested only in boy children, right? Um, for the purposes of being kind of the next boy ruler or whatever. Um, you know, and I think a lot of the, so like, 
states are almost always interested in reproduction, but they're interested in it for substantively different way reasons. And I think that's really important to pay attention to. Okay, I think we've used our time now, and I want to thank all of our speakers. We've really uh, been through a, a, an array of quite different contexts, historical contexts, geographical contexts, to get a hint of some of the richness of detail uh, from the consummation to the moral policing to the visual uh, imagery. Uh, so thank you for staying with us, and thank you to all our speakers. <laughs>